Knockout Offensive is back for Season 4 of Dragonflight Mythic Plus and this guide offers a concise refresher on three things. Number one, it compiles all the tags and tricks still usable in Season 4 and if Blizzard fixes any of these, I will note it in the pinned comments. For better clarity, I will reuse relevant footage from my previous 1 minute and plus tip videos. Number two, I'll recap the most dangerous mobs and boss mechanics of this dungeon that can break your keys as well as tips on how to handle them. This is based off running this dungeon countless times in the previous season of Dragonflight as well as PTR. Number three, any big changes or reworks to abilities from season one will be highlighted as well. This guide is meant to be a refresher, not the usual in-depth masterclass guide on my channel for Mythic Class Dungeons. The masterclass guide for Knockout Offensive you see on screen remains 99% relevant as Blizzard has only made minor adjustments to abilities for Season 4. If you're entirely new to the dungeon, I recommend pausing this video first, watch the masterclass guide, link is in the description, before you dive back into this video for more advanced tech and tips for Season 4 in this video. Let's get started. The first trick to cover that still works is basically abusing this rock on the final boss of Knockout Offensive. For those of you who are unaware, there's a way to cheese this boss to make the spear mechanic a lot less dangerous. And how it works is, regardless of phase one or phase two, he targets a player, he spears the player, and after that, he will start charging in a direction. Now this rock is positioned to the left side of the arena facing the boss before you even pull the boss and he's just patting around. So all you need to do, tank the boss over here. He will target someone with the Iron Spear, throw out the Iron Spear, and then shortly after, he will start trampling towards the direction. But because there's a hitbox on the rock, he will charge and he will get stopped by the rock. And that means that your melee doesn't have to move to get more uptime on the boss. Overall, it's just safer and more damage on the boss. Super simple to pull off. Now, the only thing I'll add about this boss and using this trick is that in the second phase where the boss starts putting out puddles on the ground, you want to tank the boss away from the rock. So you can see I drag the boss further away from the rock and that's really because in his next ability, Crackling Upheaval, he will spawn puddles, right? You can see puddles spawn here. I want to spawn it away from the rock so that I can bring the boss back to the rock over here in this phase two and then we can deal with the static spear in the exact same way. And that basically saves this entire area to be clear from those puddles, so we can keep abusing this rock. The next tag allows you to skip Batak and Belara, which is these two mini bosses just before the final boss. Now, this count was always very inefficient to do because you know it just takes bloody forever to do these two mini boss on high keys. So everyone on high keys in season one will skip them. I don't think Blizzard has fixed it, and if they have, I would basically edit it in the pin comments. But basically, the way it's done is you get someone that can drop combat to tag them. So the rogue tag them, right? And you can see Balara has basically aggro on the rogue. Now, once something like a rogue or a hunter has engaged them in combat, the tank then needs to pull the boss. So I'm the tank, I pull the boss, and once I get into combat, the rogue can then vanish. As you guys can see from my Omni CD UI here. So he vanishes, he drops combat from the two mini bosses, he then zooms back in to work on the boss with us, and that basically ensures that you don't pull the two mini bosses. Because by default, when you pull the boss just by himself, he will tag in the mini bosses together for the entire fight. By having someone pull the mini bosses, you desync that entire whole game loop mechanic thing, and that allows you to skip these two mini bosses. Just remember, you need to make up for count somewhere else in the dungeon, so you want to arrive with 100% count over here. Now, speaking about skipping these two mini bosses, there's also a tech related to these two mini bosses if somehow either Blizzard fixes this kind of skip, or number two, somehow in Pucks, you don't have anyone to do this mini boss skip. There's a way more efficient way to do these two mini bosses. Let me explain. When you do Batak and Balara, what a lot of people don't know is that as a tank, you can always bait Balara's charge into the pillars here. And I'm sure if you have a group that plays melee or very melee heavy, sometimes people just, you know, bait Balara's charge all the way to Narnia, right? And you lose melee uptime on the boss. However, as you guys can see, we are consistently baiting Balara into the walls here. And how is it done? It's very simple. Balara would always charge the person that is closest to his hitbox. So you can see, I am literally making sure that as a tank, I'm stationed closest to Balara here. So when the charge goes out, I simply sidestep, he charges the wall, and we get maximum melee uptime. And you can also bait this as a non-tank as well. Any people standing near Balara, the nearest hitbox, will determine where he charges. So hopefully with this tip, you guys can squeeze out the additional few seconds on Batak and Balara. The next skip is something that everyone uses in knockout offensive and high keys towards you know, the third or fourth week of season one. Everyone figured this out. Essentially, you kill the third boss 
which is Tira and Maruk. Then you want to fly towards the final boss area using the skit. Everyone knows this skit, you know, by mid-season. And it's just good to recap in case you're new to uh, Dragonfly. Basically, you fly off towards the cliff side of the entire dungeon. Meaning, you finish the third boss, you open your map, and you look at where the final boss is. Now, in case you don't know, all you need to know is you fly towards where all these valley and all these trees are, right? It's basically open air. And what you're trying to target for to land is as you near the final boss area, you would see these channelers, very tiny channelers, right? But you can see them. These are NPCs that are channeling stuff. And you're trying to aim for this little peak here to land where there's a hut and there's this channeler NPC and you see these two like mountain peaks over here. You want to land over here because this ensures that you won't get knocked the hell out of the entire zone because if you don't take this path and you land somewhere else, there's a chance that the zone just rejects you and just, you know, kicks you out of that zone. So land here is very safe. And then from here, you just kind of proceed on to go to the final boss area. And I'll just speed up the footage here. You can see me just jumping off. Make sure you don't pull this patrol by accident. Jump off and you're right in front of the final boss. That is the fastest flying skip in this entire dungeon. There's other flying skips, but this is what everyone uses back in Season 1. Now let's cover another cheese that was very popular in Season 1 if you're playing a prop warrior, where you pull the boss and you can actually spell reflect this wind burst if you're a prop warrior using spell reflection for giga damage. So just watch the damage meters over here. I charge into the boss. The boss is targeting me with wind burst. I pop spell reflection, you can see. As I play, he spell reflects onto himself the wind burst ability. And that hits for a massive amount of damage. As you can see, I start off the meters being way ahead of the other DPS, just simply because of the wind burst mechanic. And by the way, once you have your spell reflection back up, you can actually bait the wind burst again. And how you do it is you want to move out of melee range on the boss. And he will still target you as a tank with wind burst. Because when you're in melee range, he'll melee you. But if you're not in melee range, he'll target you with this, you know, tank buster of a spell, wind burst. And that's why you pop spell reflection, you move back into melee range, and then you reflect back onto him again for massive damage. It was like, at least for 600,000 if you see the spike in the damage meters. It's a massive amount of damage. So this is something you can abuse if you're a warrior. All right, now let's talk about the big changes that they have done for season four that is a must for you to know. And most of these reworks or big changes are actually in the final third area of the entire dungeon. So as I land here, this is a pool that involves some of these changes. And the first change you need to know has got to do with these Ohuna mobs. So these Ohuna mobs are basically birds that do a frontal. You can see this rotting wind cast. It's basically a frontal, right? In the past, you just sidestep in season one. All you need to do, move out of the frontal and you're good. However, in season four, and it's not reflected on this plater yet because this is season one footage, but if you install my season four plater, the Ohunas are now marked as interruptible casters, which is in pink, like these mobs. The rotting wind ability is now a mass kick. Because if you do not kick it in Season 4, it places a party-wide dot that hurts. So make sure you interrupt the Rotting Wind now. It's still a frontal, but you must interrupt it now. Because even if you don't get hit by the frontal, you get a dot on the entire party. So don't do that. Dangerous stuff. Instead of interrupting it, you can still stop it using crowd control from what I see on the PTR. So there's something to take note of. The other big change contains this mob here, the Beast Caller. And it's basically a pull that you do very commonly with the first pull. This Beast Caller does Heavy Slash, but it also does something in Season 1 called the Desecrating Raw. You can see it's channeling it right now, Desecrating Raw, this one. In Season 1, Desecrating Raw can be interrupted. If you fail to interrupt it, it just spawns more wolves. And those don't give any count. However, in Season 4, you can no longer interrupt this Desecrating Raw. Which means every time you tag in the Beast Caller, it will spawn those annoying wolf mobs that don't give count. And I suspect the Beast Caller is now very inefficient a mob to do. So probably people avoid doing this in Season 4. And so you understand better, near the final boss there's this Beast Caller ad. And it comes along with already pre-summoned Bakar or wolf ads. And these pre-summoned ads, they do give count. Like very little, 0.61. However, if you let Desecrating Raw go through, I'm quite sure... The summon ads, the new summon wolf ads, they don't give count. So um, it's kind of a pointless exercise. If you want to do this mob and you just keep doing the summon wolves, they don't give additional count. And that's why I think this mob will be avoided by people in season four. Okay, now let's talk through all the dangerous parts that can break your key and all the important things you need to know. This is a very standard first pull. If you're new to Dragonfly, flying right off the bat looking for this giant patrol is what everyone does in season one now. And I'm suspecting the same in season four because 
you know, you have all your cooldowns up at the start, you just want to blow everything here. The most important thing to take note of here, the horn sounder will do this thing called rally the clan. If you use my plater profile, this is recolored to another color. There'll be a voice announcer as well that signals to you that you need to use crowd control to stop rally the clan. Because if you don't, it basically buffs everyone. So we use shockwave here to stop. The other very important thing to note is the plane stomper does a cast. You always want to watch for this disrupting shout. Again, this is season one footage. So if you have my season four plater profile, you're all set, colors them in all the right colors, and you'll be very obvious you need to interrupt them. Okay, something else that's dangerous is this war spear. Whenever you see this war spear at on high fortified keys, this thing can absolutely wreck someone. So he will do this charge. You can see this swift step where he charges out and he attempts to stab someone. Now this is a tyrannical affix on a 24. On a 24 fortified, this hits for way much more and you just need to watch for people who are getting charged. Actually, you can stop the charge mid cast by stunning the mob if you're fast enough. Now, if you're not fast enough, you're being targeted, pop a defensive if you're not sure whether you live because that thing absolutely wrecks. Other than that, if you're a melee DPS, don't stand on the tank because the Lance Master has this cleave buff and it basically signals that it can cleave people. So his attacks do cleave, never ever stand with the tank. Always stand at the back of the tank. That's the TLDR. Ah, you saw the two war spears charge the same target, super dangerous. On high keys, just make sure you Take note of that. Pop defensives or stop them. The first boss is super simple on knockout offensive. Honestly, very easy boss. No one should ever have troubles with this. All I'll say is that as a tank, just make sure that you bring the boss together to cleave down the ad uh, with. If you have a priest, you can actually mind control this ad. So you can actually skip one ad totally. Um, some people just CC the ads permanently. Also doable. You can just CC the ad, leave it be. And you know, you can just focus on a boss entirely possible, but naturally in pucks, you just want to take the easy way out. Other than that, you know, make sure that you are always using the lance to interrupt the boss. If you don't interrupt the boss, you, you know, you'll be in trouble. Uh, pro tip is the sub here that spawns will always run towards the next lance that will be active. So because it's running in this direction, you know that the next lance will be basically where my cursor is. That's the next direction. And as a healer or ranged DPS, you want to try and run out and basically get uh, to the lance, which is why you start seeing the druid already running towards that area. You can see to the right here, the lance is kind of glowing off the edge of my screen. So that's how you know which lance is ready next. Real simple boss. Now, after you kill the first boss, most people would then check with their parties, do you have cooldowns? And looking at our party, you know, we avoid eruption and whatnot. So we're like, okay, we have cooldowns and we will go straight for the waterfall. So this waterfall pool is probably the harder pool in the second part of the entire dungeon. This part, I would say the most dangerous bit is basically allowing for certain casts to go off that is very dangerous. So there's lots of casters here. And all I'll say is you want to kick as much as possible. If you're short on kicks on high for the fight, not good. This dungeon will be tricky at this point because they do a lot of dangerous abilities and they're all, you know, very important to kick, to be honest. A lot of damage coming through. The most dangerous one is Tempest. And what I'll say is that if everyone saves their kick for Tempest and you do not have kicks available for the other, you know, cast, it's also a very bad idea because there's just a lot of spell damage to heal through and your healers would absolutely kind of, you know, struggle. So that's what I would say. That's number one. Probably you want to make sure you assign kicks to this particular area. So in this case, the rogue is kind of locking down with his blind and CCs and whatnot. So that's kind of a really pro play. Other than that, I want to comment on these, um, this pool. This pool on Fortify actually does truck uh, because the Storm Shield mobs, they kind of hurt for a fair bit. Not only that, the Thunder Beast does this Thunder Strike thing that must be kicked. On high Fortify, I would say the Thunder Beast needs a proper kick rotation because if you don't, you're just in for a bad time. You look at this like chain lightning, right? Make sure you spread because if you don't, it's going to bounce off um, people and make sure you kick Thunder Strike. And other than that, you should be Gucci. The other thing that you should note is this lightning shield that the Storm Shield places on themselves. And you can see my chamois actually purging them. I'm pretty sure it's a chamois. He is offensively purging them and you do not want to let the lightning shield go off. If you let the Storm Shield go off, the lightning shield, it actually does like party-wide damage that really, really trucks. So you need to be very prepared that if you don't have an offensive purge, you need to burst through the shield um, of the Storm Shield. So just something to take note of. You see this Storm Shield? Yep. If you don't have an offensive purge, make sure you kind of just target the shield, right? Don't let it break. It's going to be a lot of damage. Now on this second boss, we kind of talked about it earlier. There's some cheeses on spell reflection, but it doesn't change the fact that on tyrannical keys, this boss is feared by so many people. At the end of the day, it's all about keeping the orbs away from the boss. And you can destroy these orbs that's trying to reach the boss in two ways. Number one, it places this debuff on you where if there's any orbs in your circle, you will explode them and they basically spawn this swirly 
just move out the swirlies. So that's one way of destroying the ops. The other way is you manually run over the ops, like what uh, the chamois is doing over here. You can see he's picking up stacks. And the reason why he's gaining these stacks, you can see on the unit frame, is that that gives him a DPS buff. So ideally, you're incentivized to pick up the ops, but number one rule is never let any ops go near the boss. That's the cardinal sin of this boss. So just take note of that. And the reason why you are trying to set up for this boss, and by the way, the boss will get buffed. And if you have the weak auras for dungeon weak auras, or you just look at your plater and my plater profile, it will tell you that this boss is currently buffed. You want to offensively purge it, which is why uh, the Shami basically purged it, I'm pretty sure. So if you don't, going to Electrical Storm, the boss will have amplified damage. And this part absolutely trucks if you don't have a, a cooldown. And healers are absolutely terrified at this point, which is why to let the healer have um, you know, a better time, you want to let the healer get some orbs because and you can see the healer here having seven stacks of the orb because that stacks of the orbs, actually the surge of power buff here increases your throughput. So allow your healers to get some orbs. Don't be greedy and just get all the orbs for yourself. And then the other thing you want to do is you want to huddle near the healer. So in this case, there's airflow, right? You want to be in the airflow so the healer can basically heal the entire party pretty well. And then after that, you guys can spread out and whatnot. Again, that's entirely fine. I'm baiting the wind burst. And you can see here, we're going to the second electrical storm, right? The healer has 10 stacks of the orbs. And this is done deliberately because you want to get your healers as much throughput as possible for this electrical storm. You can see absolutely trucks, right? The, the Shadow Priest is even helping with Vamp Aura, or rather Vamp Embrace, and everyone's popping defensives. Very scary overlaps here. This, this boss is a banners on Electrical Storm on High Tyrannical, in this case, a plus 24. So make very sure um, if you're not full health here and the boss is buffed, by the way, and this thing goes off, you want to pop a cooldown because if not, it's going to truck. And you can see if anyone is not top, oof, painful. This is really a healer fight. Do whatever it takes to help your healer. Pop defensives, pop your health pots, stack near the healer, especially when the storm mechanic occurs. After that, you go to the third area. And in this third area, I would say that there isn't really that much things to take note of except what I pointed out earlier. The Ohunas are now mobs that you must kick. Beyond that, just try and get as many death boat kicks as possible. Avoid taking the beast collars now, I reckon. And on one of the final mounts where you need to clear these mini bosses, you would have these warrior mobs. And these warrior mobs basically place a debuff on the tank. Now, what debuff on the tank is basically kind of like a mortal strike debuff. And you will see it do that here. This warrior do this mortal strike debuff on a tank. Now, if you're ever tanking more than like one warrior, the mortal strike debuff can actually stack. It's not like a massive deal on lower end keys, but on high keys, this thing could be a real trouble. So as a tank, just make sure you take note of your mortal strike debuff. Ah, this final pool, you see. This final pool has two warriors and the mortal strike debuff can stack twice. So um, that's something that is dangerous. You just want to take note of it. And now let's talk about Tira and Maruk. Now Tira and Maruk is one of those bosses on Tyrannical that everyone fears as well because of a certain mechanic. And I'll talk about it. So one of the traditions that tanks would do is that they would face pull Tira and then they would tag in Maruk. It's a very slight thing to do and it's basically to desync the abilities in a way that you try and stagger them out so that you don't get bad overlaps. I don't know if Blizzard has fixed this, but I know this is what people used to do in season one. And I mean, there's no downside to this. So just follow suit as per what I did. Just face pull on your mount and then tag in Maruk. Um, this is a very finicky boss because, and I know they nerfed it, you know, in season one. I think this is pre-nerf footage. But the mechanics are exactly the same. And this is the most important thing you need to do as a tank. This is a tank fight. Tira would always try and leap away. And you want to make sure that the distance between Tira and Maruk is always minimized because whenever they're apart, they gain a buff that causes them to do more damage the longer they are away from one another. So you always need to keep them stacked on top of one another. It's the number one rule as a tank. And very shortly here, you will see the most dangerous ability, this Gale Arrow. Gale Arrow absolutely wrecks a party on high keys. And the best way everyone dealt with it on high keys is basically to stack tight. You see, we mark ourselves and we stack tight and we pop our defensives. In this case, Vamp Embrace is being used to try and top everyone up before the damage of the Gale Arrow goes out. The reason why you stack as well is because the tornadoes will then go out in a very neat pattern. And you can see even with a pre-planned kind of, you know, stack spot, we almost lost the rope and the, and the priest. It does a lot of damage. Um, and all I'll say is that you want to pop a defensive or a personal pot if you're not topped for the gale mechanic because it just trucks. Now, the benefit of that is that you can see the tornadoes, they'll start turning backwards. And as they turn backwards, they all converge on the same point. So it just makes the entire fight way, way easier 
to deal with because then the tornadoes are neat. But you want to coordinate with your party whether you're doing the stack strategy for the guild arrow at the start of the key. Don't assume because some people, they don't stack and then, you know, it ends up being really messy. So make sure you always check with your party before you pull, uh, you know, the bosses. All right, next, Tira will do this repel mechanic and you can interrupt it instantly. If not, you get pushed back. However, I've also seen groups kind of delay uh, the, the interrupt here. Because at this point in time, you're just really dealing with the Earth Splitter mechanic, which is a Maruxa's Kono kind of swirlies on the ground. Now, the important thing here as a tank is that you want to dodge the swirlies, yes, but remember, Maruk is the melee mob, Tira is the range mob, and you want to dodge the swirlies in a way where Maruk will still end up very close to Tira. So you can see that I'm very careful to just dodge and dance around them because I want to keep them very close to one another. By keeping them close to one another, remember, I ensure that they don't get their buffs off. You see, when they are far apart from one another, they gain this buff that allows them to do more damage. The moment they come close to one another, you can see these two stacks of the empowered buff, it will go away. See, it goes away over here. And, but there's a slight delay, you see. So I always want to make sure that as a tank, I'm positioning these mobs, especially Maruk, because it's the only one I can move, or Tira is just over there shooting arrows. I want to make sure Maruk is always close to Tira. Very important as a tank. If you're able to do that and make sure you have a cooldown for Brutalize the Tank Buster, you shouldn't struggle with this fight as long as people are on the same page regarding Gale Arrows. But yeah, Gale Arrows, the most dangerous mechanic. You can see everyone's stacked here. Very scary mechanic. And, and you see almost people almost die over here. And this is, you know, popping cooldowns and whatnot. So um, just, and you can see the Shami actually died because he died to the the lightning swirlies from, uh, you know, the affix, the seasonal affix of season one. But yeah, it's a dangerous mechanic because of that and he had to ank. And if you're able to do all that, you should be able to clear them properly. Um, the other thing to take note of is you want to make sure you have enough count from the third area before going to the final boss. The reason is because the final boss area where Khan is, is just not ideal for picking up count because the count there is inefficient. You want to pick up all your counts in the third area, to be honest. Um, before you fly over. So after you pick up all our count, we'll mount up, we'll fly towards the final boss. And at this point in time, we are 100% count. So that's how everyone did it in season one. And if there's massive changes to the routes, obviously I might do another masterclass video. But you land in front of the final boss and we have already covered the trickery around Balara and Batak, how to skip them. We've also talked about the cheese of the rock, but here I'll introduce something new to you. A rogue can actually cheese it too. And how a rogue cheese it is this. You can see Iron Spear is about to go out in three seconds and it will target the rogue. And instantly he cancels the cast because a rogue can basically vanish and drop combat and stuff. You can see Iron Spear goes out as interrupted, right? Because a rogue can basically shadow mail, drop combat, vanish, and you can see vanish is on cooldown over here on his Omni CD. If you have someone that can do this kind of invis tech, it's actually pretty good. This renting strike, by the way, on a tank absolutely trucks as well. On tyrannical keys, make sure as a tank, you have something prepared because those strikes, they kind of hurt. Other than that, dodge the frontal from upheaval. The intermission is the most scary part for this boss. A lot of keys are bricked here as well. The best thing you can do is to pre-assign kicks to these four mobs. You can see these four Stormcaster mobs spawning at the intermission. You want to make sure you assign kicks because the moment you kick the mobs, you can then start bringing them together. You can see all four of them are casting Stormbolt, right? Kick them, bring them towards the middle of the boss area, and you can start DPSing them. Now, there's a lot of things going on at this point. If you do not have sufficient kicks and you're very worried about the damage output, which is a lot of damage, because firstly, the boss, through his passive siphon power is causing party-wide damage through the storm. Now, they slightly nerfed the storm for season four based on patch notes, but I suspect you still hurt. It's still tough. So one thing you can do is to minimize the amount of damage going out by CCing one of the storm casters. This is also a common strategy in high keys. If you have a death knight, they can A-bomb limb and pull all the mobs uh, towards you and they can basically act as a pseudo interrupt as well, which is really good. But the point is you want to kick all of them, clump them up, use AOE CCs to make sure they never get their storm boat off because these things absolutely wreck. Um, at the same time, make sure you watch your feet because, and that's why I'm playing top down because these lightning swirlies, they can one shot as well. So always play top down, always watch your feet, clear all the mobs ASAP because the healer is absolutely struggling here. You can see he's struggling to keep everyone top. The phase intermission, only ends when all these uh, mobs eventually die. So that's that. And then you can see phase two now will resume. And one very tiny tip I forgot to mention earlier, as a warrior, you can actually spell reflect the conductive strike. And that's, you know, um, pretty handy. Uh, and this thunder strike can be reflected as well, by the way, FYI. So make sure you don't eat swirlies here. The last thing I'll say is that make sure that you keep the rock area free of puddles. You move the boss towards 
the back of the room. Um, and that's where I always get people to drop their crackling upheaval, as I mentioned earlier. So over this part with this crackling upheaval, make sure you don't stack because if you stack, you're pretty much dead. You can see how much damage it does. Other than that, that's pretty much everything you need to know for a refresher for season four, everything that could break your key and all the tech you need to know. And so with this, I hope you can actually ace this key on Fortified and Tyrannical. If you found this guide helpful, make sure to smash that subscribe button. And last but not least, a big thank you to all the Patreon subscribers that you see on screen. Thank you so much for making my content possible. And if you'd like to support us, the link to my Patreon is in the description. Thanks for watching, and the video in the middle of the screen will be very helpful for you to refresh your memory for Season 4 Alcatraz Academy. Enjoy the video, I'll see you soon.